Well, good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church of Cuyahoga Falls. For those here gathered in the sanctuary and for those of you who are worshiping with us via the live stream, whether it's Sunday morning or some other time during the week, know that you are welcome and you are invited in this time of worship. A little bit of housekeeping for you this morning. I've been working with Sarah over the last couple of weeks and she has created for us a little record of attendance. We wanna get back into the habit of just paying attention to who's able to be with us in worship on Sunday mornings. It also, to be honest, really helps us when we get to the end of the year and the wider denomination says, so how many folks have been coming to church on Sunday mornings? <laughs> it's helpful to be able to look back and have some sense of how many uh, that number is. So if you can find one of these little squares in the pew in front of you and just fill it out and at your leisure, it could be when the offering plate is passed later in the service or at the end of worship, if you could just drop that up in the offering plate, we would appreciate it and it will help us to know who is with us in worship on Sunday mornings. With that announcement before us, we are going to give ourselves the gift of a minute this morning. So I want to invite you to just settle in where you are, take a moment to center your heart and your mind, and we are going to listen as Beth plays our prelude this morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Please join me in the call to worship. How very good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Unity is precious, like a piece of pine jewelry or a family heirloom. Unity is luxurious, like the most expensive meal or the best bottle of wine you've ever had. Unity is refreshing, like a cool mist on a hot day. Unity is life-giving, what eternal life truly looks like. God has ordained unity for us. God intends us to dwell in unity. Amen. Amen. Please join us for the gathering song, Faith of Our Fathers, number 635, verses 1, 2, and 3.
may be seated. I did not get a chance to ask for a microphone volunteer this morning. Rosemary, or oh, Regan, Regan had a hand right up in the air today. <laughs> All right, if you have a joy or a concern you would lift this morning, we have an opportunity today to support one another in prayer. Thank you. I'm just asking for continued prayers. My friend Diane, we mentioned last week, um, they have discovered it is stage four cancer. So she's going to have a very rough road ahead. Um, the next request is a bit ironic. Uh, I have a sister, and she has one son, and they live in Texas. Hmm. And of course, Texas has been <laughs> in the news recently. The interesting thing is that Trey, her son, is a policeman. And he called her this week and said, Mom, please listen and be, be proud for me because I have been promoted and I'm now on the SWAT team. Wow. Uh, rather hard news to take for a mom. And so I, I ask for prayers for all of us, the Edwards Thomas family, as, as Trey does what he has chosen to do. He has a young son. For teachers, students, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how anyone could have survived this week, mm -hmm. but prayers just for everyone in this world. Thanks, Jenny. Just general prayers for family members who are having health problems. And my aunt, who's down in North Carolina, who has the, the health issues, her youngest daughter was in an accident on riding her scooter mm -hmm. and shattered her leg and ripped open her spleen and is stable out of the hospital but in a nursing home for the next month or so to recuperate. And she's what's her going first, to see. What's her first name? Allison. Allison. Um, I'm just asking for continued prayers for Sharon Lanier. Um, this past week, she was in the hospital because of her back. They found out she injured some discs, and she was in the hospital for, I think, a two or three days, and she's out now. Um, and she has a brace that she has to wear on the front of her so she can't bend over, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to help her back. But she's in a lot of pain, and Lee says she's on oxycodone, and she's kind of loopy. So prayers for Lee, who's taking care of her, and prayers for Sharon, who's still hurting from her back. Joy, I have prayers for my aunt Linda, whose uh, son-in-law uh, passed away and came to the death of five months ago from her kidney. Mm -hmm. So well, or had complications after the surgery. So prayers for uh, Linda Williams. Yes, uh, this is Steve. I'd like uh, continued prayers for my friend Nathan, who's continuing to have uh, severe problems with his issues. Thank you for your prayers for Cheryl. Uh, she's doing well, and then this Friday she'll be back in the hospital to maybe help get those uh, arteries open again. She's got another one that's got a couple of discs going up. So continue your prayers, Steve. Will you join me in the spirit and attitude of prayer this morning? Faithful and loving God, we come before you today with a lot of things on our hearts. This is Memorial Day weekend, so we have an opportunity uh, to come before you in gratitude for a lot of people who have given of themselves in service to others. We come before you uh, with gratitude for the beautiful weather, the opportunity to have a little extra time perhaps this weekend with family and friends. We also come with heavy hearts, recognizing that events have unfolded this past week that are unspeakable. And there are times we come before you in prayer and it just wouldn't do to have easy words 
for a particular situation. And so this morning, um, we just bring the reality of who we are, the reality of uh, situations that are faced in our world, both in this country and in other places where we just know folks are suffering immensely. And we ask not only that you would be present with them, that you would be a source of grace to them, but that you would just continue to nudge our hearts to find whatever small ways we can, whatever small ways you give us to be a source of grace and blessing and love and inclusion and healing in a world that is indeed so often broken. God, we recognize this morning that there are people we love and care about who are specifically struggling with some health challenges and some battles right now, and so we want to lift them up to you and ask that you would be a source of grace to them right now. We continue to pray for Megan um, dealing with some serious eye problems. We know that that is interfering with her ability to live her life fully. So we ask that you would just be with her, that you would grant her grace, that you would give wisdom to the people who are caring for her, that her vision uh, and her health might be restored. We want to continue to pray for Diane, um, having received such a difficult diagnosis and now finding out that her cancer is stage four and that it is a difficult road ahead of her. We ask that you would just strengthen her body, her mind, her spirit, that you would give her uh, the courage and the fortitude she needs for this road ahead, and that you would bring people alongside her who can be a very real source of help and love to her right now. We want to pray for Linda and that entire family. Uh, as she has lost her son-in-law, uh, complications from a surgery, we know how, um, how filled with grief her heart must be right now. We ask that you would come alongside her in grace, and again, that you would bring people alongside her who are able to be a tangible source of support and help to her and to her whole family as they are suffering uh, such a difficult loss right now. We want to pray for Sharon, dealing with these back problems and everything that comes with it, now wearing a brace and dealing with different uh, drugs to deal with the pain. And we ask that you would just be with her, that uh, you would keep her safe through all of this, that you would give her the strength and the fortitude to endure what must be endured, and that uh, indeed people would be wise enough to help find her ways that she might not be in so much pain. We want to pray for Lee, that you would just grant the grace needed as a caregiver. That is also a tough road. So we ask that you would just surround them uh, with understanding, with love for one another, that you would smooth the way forward and that Sharon might uh, quickly be back to feeling more herself. We pray for Allison this morning, having been in this scooter accident, and it sounds like the injuries uh, were significant. We ask that you would just um, continue to smooth that recovery, that you would grant her patience and grace, as it is going to take some time for her to get back to feeling fully herself. We ask that you would just be present with her um, and grant grace to those who are caring for her right now. We would pray for other family members dealing with health problems right now. We don't always choose to name names or to share all the details aloud, but you know how it is with us and how it is with our loved ones. And so we just ask that in some of those unspoken situations, you would be um, a particularly noticeable source of grace, uh, and that you would grant wisdom, that you would grant insight, and that you would uh, grant love and patience in those situations. God, we uh, want to continue to pray for Cheryl. We're grateful to hear that she is doing so well. We know that she goes in for another procedure to deal with this heart blockage in a couple of weeks. And so we ask that you would just calm any nerves, that you would be a source of grace to her in this time of waiting, um, that you would just continue to surround her uh, with your healing presence as she awaits this needed procedure in a couple of weeks. God, we want to lift a tray up to you right now. In the wake of all that has happened this past week, we recognize um, that there are folks who put their lives on the line all the time to protect the safety and the health of others. And as he now has been promoted to this SWAT team, that comes with a whole mix of emotions for people who love him. So we ask that you would be present with him. Um, we thank you for his courage, his willingness to act um, courageously on behalf of others. And we ask that you would just grant grace uh, to his whole family, knowing that they will inevitably worry about him. We just ask that you would keep your hand on that whole situation and on all those uh, who willingly put themselves in harm's way in order to protect others. God, knowing that sometimes uh, we hold a lot in our hearts that we don't choose to say aloud, we would just keep silence before you for a moment this morning and ask that you simply meet each one of us right where we are.
It's in a spirit of love and grace that we pray together as Jesus taught his disciples so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will conclude our prayer time by singing one of the great hymns of our faith, number 86 in your hymnal, verses 1 and 3 of Great is Thy Faithfulness. This morning, this morning's first gospel reading is from John 17, 20 through 26. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who, who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me, and I have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory which you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made, you, I made your name known to them, and I will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite any children or young people who'd like to come forward for just a moment.
So you have already heard us allude a few times to some things that happened in our world this past week that I think have left many of us um, sad and shaken up. We're not going to talk a lot about that this morning because the truth is I think different families have different ways that they talk about things uh, like what happened this past week. So I'm going to let you talk about it with your family. But when I am feeling particularly sad or shaken up, I very often turn to music and I thought of a very simple song that I learned years ago. My very first job uh, for a church was actually teaching music to four and five year olds. Uh, it's the very first thing I ever did for a church out in Hudson. And uh, I've been teaching this song to kids ever since. The words change as we go along. So what I would invite you to do is when you start to kind of get the hang of the tune, feel free to hum along, or if you want to kind of sing ooh along, even if you don't quite feel confident about the words, you're still all welcome to participate. So we're just going to share a song together this morning and let that be enough. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 16. We're actually going to pick up right where we left off last week. This is some of Paul's companions are speaking here. One day as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, 
They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They're Jews and they're advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they'd given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and they ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, the jailer put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening with them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At that same hour of the night, he took them and he washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before him, them, and he has in his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. It probably goes without saying that every week I spend a lot of time thinking about the scripture readings, deciding if I'm going to speak about one of them or both of them, and trying to come up with some interesting hook to pique your interest. Some weeks it's all very straightforward. Both scriptures seem to point in the same general direction and the pieces all fall into place. Some weeks are harder. The two readings might seem unrelated at first glance or they don't connect very well to the date on the calendar or the season of the year. But I'll tell you there are other weeks, weeks like this one, when it feels like the scripture readings and my own thoughts and the date on the calendar and circumstances in the world around us are all just haywire. This morning I'm supposed to preach a sermon about unity as Jesus clearly calls for it in John 17. I'm supposed to interpret another odd story from Acts that has several dramatic elements, but no clear point. I'm supposed to bear in mind that it's Memorial Day weekend, a time set aside to honor people who have made tremendous sacrifices for our country and for the human community in general. And I can't possibly ignore the agonizing truth that yet another horrific incident of violence took place in a school on Tuesday. It's a lot of threads some more important than others, and I want you to know I really wrestled with how to approach all these competing themes this morning. I want to say to you that I usually try not to get swept up in emotion about whatever headline has most recently splashed across social media feeds and news sources. Sunday mornings would get very disjointed indeed if we heard about every dramatic development in global news or domestic politics and tried to track all of those in our worship and our sermon. There's a part of me that doesn't even want to talk about Texas today, or about gun violence, or about mass shootings, or about hatred, or about whatever it was that led a deranged individual to snuff out the lives of 21 precious human beings this week. The ugly truth is that gun violence is no more or less of a problem today than it was last Sunday, and the Sunday before that, and the Sunday before that. And it will continue to be a problem every single day until we experience a collective change of heart on this matter. Let us not pretend that Tuesday is the only bad day we had with guns this week or this month or this year. We just noticed on Tuesday. Rather than venture down a dark tunnel of despair this morning, we're going to do what we always do. We're going to turn to scripture and we're going to ask ourselves what we as people of faith can do to make a genuine difference in our world. It's the question we ask every week, I hope, though we might as well be honest that it feels a little more poignant and a little more urgent 
this morning. We began today with a dream, Jesus' dream that we might all be one. This particular speech on Jesus' lips that we heard Jim read from John 17, it strikes me in two ways. First of all, we can imagine that Jesus actually said these words or something very much like them. I need to tell you that the gospel according to John was written a long time after Jesus' actual lifespan, something like 100 years. So you can use your own logic and sensibility and you can figure out that these words probably underwent a bit of editing as people remembered and retold and retold them again in order to preserve Jesus' incredible legacy. Even so, we might suppose Jesus did say something like this, and I think it's a great analog to something like Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, a speech that was powerful and memorable, and it painted a picture of what is possible for the human community. In this passage, Jesus is thinking not only about the followers around him, but also about the people those followers are going to meet and invite to follow so that they can invite others. He's thinking about the followers of the followers of the followers. This is powerful because it's a recognition that the Jesus story isn't only about the privileged few who were lucky enough to be there at the beginning. The Jesus story is about everyone, about bringing others into the circle, and to use Jesus' words, making sure that the glory given to Jesus and Jesus' followers is also poured out into other people so they might know they are also a part of this great story, fully included and loved. It really is a vision of unity. And I want to say this morning that this church, First Christian Church of Cuyahoga Falls, lives proudly into this vision in a couple of ways. Your history is in the disciples' tradition, a tradition that has always sought the unity of the church and the unity of believers. I hope you also recognize that being a federated church, holding the name of two denominations, United Church of Christ and Disciples of Christ, is yet another way of living into this vision of a more unified and connected body of believers. I hope you hold proudly to that shared identity. I think it's a powerful witness in these troubled days. As Jesus speaks about unity, he makes it clear that this is how the world will recognize God's presence. The church is to be a living embodiment of the unity God intends. That living witness will testify to all people the kind of love, the kind of radical love that characterizes God's kingdom. A moment ago, I said this passage struck me in two ways. I reminded you that the Gospel of John was written a long time after Jesus' life. So in addition to appreciating these inspiring words that Jesus says, I think we've also got to ask ourselves a challenging question this morning. As the writers of this book came together and shared stories about Jesus' life, as they made decisions about what they would write down and include in this particular book of the Bible, why did they choose to include these words. Jesus doesn't do anything miraculous here. He doesn't perform a miracle. He doesn't heal anyone. He doesn't settle an argument. He doesn't shoot back something really clever. Why did they search their memories and search their tradition for these words about unity and shared identity and love? The answer is a hard truth that brings us right back to our heartache this morning. Just a hundred years after Jesus' own lifetime, just a hundred years after his acts of healing and kindness, just a hundred years after he preached a gospel of inclusion and grace and love and goodness, the church was already splintered around those principles. It took very little time for our human nature to kick in and break us apart, even as we all professed that we just want to follow Jesus. The author or authors of John included this story, this speech, because they already saw, so soon after Jesus' lifetime, how desperately the church was struggling with unity. This all leaves us with a complex task this morning. We have to ask ourselves what God's unity looks like. We've got to figure out what so often goes wrong that leaves us at a distance from God and from our neighbor. And most difficult of all, we've got to figure out what we're going to do about it. 
Our second reading this morning was a big chunk of Acts 16, and there's quite a bit of action in this passage. Paul and Silas encounter a slave girl. She's been making money for her owners by telling people's fortunes or something like that. Paul frees this young woman, which results in a permanent loss of income for those owners, at which point the irate men have Paul and Silas arrested. In prison, Paul and Silas pray, they sing hymns, and then in a dramatic turn of events, there's this earthquake that shakes the prison and their shackles fall away. The jailer in charge of their detention is frantic that he'll be held responsible for this jailbreak, but Paul and Silas stay and reassure him, and he and his family ultimately come to be followers of the Jesus movement. Now, the jailbreak story is pretty impressive, I will grant you. And I have to tell you that in all the sermons I've ever heard about Acts 16, most of the focus has been given to the miraculous nature of Paul and Silas's escape from prison. We have whole songs, worship songs, hymns, written about that earthquake that loosed their shackles and freed them from their cell. I have heard little, if any consideration, given to the circumstances that landed them in prison in the first place. I would suggest it isn't exactly Paul's finest moment, perhaps an instance in which he does the right thing kind of for the wrong reason. And it inspires me to ask myself how this story might have unfolded if Jesus had been there to encounter this enslaved young woman being used as a commodity to enrich her owners. As it's told in Acts 16, Paul's on his way to pray with some colleagues when he passes by this slave girl who's said to have the ability to divine spirits or read the future or whatever it is. The bottom line, which the author is careful to state, is that this young money is bringing, or this young lady is bringing in a lot of money for her owners. Since she had this gift of discernment or insight, She's quick to identify something different about Paul and his companions. Every time they walk by, she even follows them and yells, These men are slaves of the Most High God who have come to bring you the way of salvation. It's not an insult. It's not an accusation. In fact, she, more than anyone else around her, seems to realize the power and the potential of these Christ followers. This is where I wish the story took a different turn. I imagine how it might have unfolded if Jesus had been there himself. I can imagine Jesus recognizing the presence of God's spirit in this young woman, as he so often did in unexpected people, and inviting her to bring her gifts and abilities and follow him. I can imagine him preaching words of freedom and chastising anyone who would seek to keep others in bondage for their own gain. That's how I wish the story unfolded. Paul doesn't handle matters quite so gracefully. The text tells us he's annoyed with the woman's shouting until one day he gets fed up and he orders the spirit out of her altogether. It is that action, removing the means by which her owners could make money off this enslaved woman, that gets Paul and Silas beaten and thrown in jail. Whatever his motive, I do think Paul intended to do a good thing for this woman. She had a special trait that was being exploited for money. By freeing her of that trait, he at least eliminated the means by which her owners could take advantage of her. We can imagine, though, a few ways we might encourage Paul to have taken things a step further. We know that early Christian communities shared their wealth in order to support those without any means to support themselves. Wouldn't it have been inspiring if Paul had invited this woman into their community and offered her some role by which she could earn her keep and be supported by those around her. We know that early Christian communities broke down all sorts of boundaries and barriers in welcoming people from different ethnic and faith traditions. Wouldn't it have been powerful if Paul had offered this slave girl a place in the community of those who follow Jesus? We know that early Christians frequently put their lives on the line to stand up for justice for people who were oppressed. Wouldn't it have been incredible if Paul had offered to buy this woman's freedom altogether? Those things didn't happen. We have the story we have. But it's an opportunity to shine a bright light back onto those words we heard on Jesus' lips in John 17, words that challenge us to see God's glory in 
every person we encounter and do whatever we can to include, to free, to uplift, to edify, to strengthen, and to enable them to live into their own God-given identity. This is God's model of unity. It is the belief that no person, however different from us, can simply be left alone to suffer grave injustice or mistreatment. God's vision of unity demands that we advocate tirelessly on behalf of those who are hurting or exploited, even if it costs us something. Whatever his motivation, Paul's action on behalf of that slave girl cost him something. It cost him his freedom. Perhaps without even intending to, Paul lives into God's call to unity, a call that asks us to be willing to make sacrifices and give of ourselves so that others are not left behind, left in bondage, left to suffer, left to be exploited, left to die. It's Memorial Day weekend. Tomorrow we are going to pause to remember and celebrate the selflessness of countless people who have given themselves on the field of battle. I don't have figures for the number of American service members and related professionals who have lost their lives, securing freedom not only for us here in the United States, but also for people in troubled circumstances in places around the world. And I want to acknowledge that much like Paul's story this morning, the story of our U.S. military is not perfect. Our intentions are not always blameless. Not every decision turns out to have been the best or the most honorable. But, ostensibly, the individuals who choose to serve in the various branches of the service do so because they are willing to give something of themselves on behalf of others. It is that willingness that we celebrate tomorrow. You know, there's always some tension between our rights as individuals and the necessary sacrifice to create a better way for others. Let's be honest this morning. Soldiers who have died on the battlefield had a right to live longer. Brave men and women who have returned to their families with injuries or PTSD or with ongoing mental and health challenges, they had a right to live their lives without being bothered by such things. Millions of deployed persons across the years had the right to be home with their families to see their spouses and their partners, to be present at their children's milestone events. These people across the decades gave up some of their rights to preserve and protect the health and well-being of others who were not always able to fight for themselves. It is an inspiring picture that I think looks quite a bit like God's vision for unity, that vision in which we just can't leave people alone in their suffering or their exploitation, a vision in which those with greater resources are called to stand alongside those with fewer resources and lend their strength so that somehow we might all flourish together. That doesn't always mean war or violence. In fact, I dream of a world in which swords truly are beaten into plowshares. And in truth, the military in this country does a great deal beyond waging war. Servicemen and women participate in projects all the time to develop and support secure and sustain communities around the world. It isn't perfect, but it is admirable in many respects. And I think it's a challenge to all of us to ask what we are willing to sacrifice. What right are we willing to yield a little bit of so that others might live longer, better, healthier, and fuller lives? It is a pertinent question for us in the wake of this week's events. It is a pertinent question for followers of Jesus all the time. Like Paul, we will not be perfect. Sometimes our motivations are a bit suspect. But let us not lose heart. Let us not be deterred from working for God's vision of unity, a unity that leaves no one behind, leaves no one out. May God give us the grace we need. Amen. We move now into a time of responding to God's word. One way we do that is through the sharing of our tithes and offerings. I think Jim is going to...
uh, carry our plate down the aisle and back this morning if that is a comfortable way for you to give. But I also want to remind you always that money is just one of many ways that we respond to God's Spirit. So as we sing our beautiful offertory song this morning, His Eyes on the Sparrow, I would just invite you to be attentive to the nudge of the Holy Spirit in your own heart in whatever form that might take. pray with me the prayer of dedication on the screen. God of grace, you have created us to be one race, one people, one church, one world. Yet we are so fragmented and so separated from one another. Forgive us for the brokenness we have caused and give us strength to endure the brokenness that is simply an unavoidable part of the human condition. May the gifts we give today work to unite your people as one voice for justice and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll invite you to be seated. We come now to our time of communion, and I would simply remind you this morning that we practice an open table. Uh, you don't need to be a member of this or any church in order to participate this morning. All are truly welcome. And uh, we haven't said this in a while, but if you are worshiping with us online, please feel free always to use whatever communion elements you have at the ready, even if it's as simple as a cracker and a cup of water. Um, the important thing is that we all gather in spirit at Christ's table. We'll prepare our hearts by singing together in this very room, number 295 in your hymnal.
Christ our Lord invites to this table all who yearn to belong to him, even in the face of tragedy and suffering, who earnestly repent of their sin and who seek the peace and welfare of all people. On this particular day, we confess our anger, our fear, and our prejudice before God and each other. The truth is that at times, fear and anger overwhelm us. We lose our grip on Christ's way, and in panic, we forget to trust one. We fail to extend care to others. We seek to blame one another when tragedy happens. We need God's forgiveness for our anger and for our sin. We invite God to reorient us in steadfast love and free us for compassionate service to others through Jesus Christ our Lord. Around this table, we have an opportunity to live out God's incredible vision for unity. Right here and right now, all are welcome. Every life is precious and valued. No one is expendable. As we break the bread today, we are reminded that it represents Jesus' willingness to face his own suffering in order that others might live freely in the abundant spirit we call eternal life. He endured suffering in his own body so we might understand the preciousness of each other's lives and personhood, right down to the smallest child. We eat this bread today in remembrance of Jesus' incredible sacrifice for us. As we share the cup today, we're reminded it represents a promise that we can never be separated from the love of God. No matter how depraved our human behavior at times, no matter how bleak the landscape may appear some days, no matter how maddening the inaction of those who have the power to create change, we know that neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. As we share the cup this morning, we do it remembering that incredible love for all people. Beth, will you pray for us? Holy Spirit and Father and Son in whom all are baptized, one giver of many gifts, one food of many cares, one speaker of every tongue, renew in our day the wonders of Pentecost and grant that people of every race and nation may understand one another and as one, proclaim the praises of God. Grant that all may be one, as you, Spirit, with the Father and the Son, are one God and one Lord. Grant unity to the body of Christ. Grant unity to the human family. Soul breath of every living thing may all be one with you. In the name of Christ. Amen.
Amen. I have a handful of announcements for you this morning. Before I jump into those, um, I would like to draw your attention. You may have noticed that we have some artwork surrounding the sanctuary this morning. I want to tell you just a little bit about it and then make a little plug for a guest speaker we're going to have here in a couple of weeks. Um, on Good Friday, we had the opportunity to experience this artwork. These are paintings that were commissioned by death row inmates, um, and they speak a powerful witness, I think, to the presence of God's Spirit in all people. So I would invite you, if you would like to, following worship today, you can read a little bit about it here in front, and uh, you can just walk from the sign at this front corner of the sanctuary around to the back and back up this side, and you can experience the full Stations of the Cross. And I think this morning it is just a powerful reminder um, of Christ's self-giving and Christ's love for us. So I would invite you to just take that in if you would like to. I also want to mention to you that two weeks from this morning, I am going to be in Zimbabwe at my son's graduation from Africa University. And you are going to have an extraordinary guest preacher by the name of Reverend Dr. Jack Sullivan. He is the executive director of the Ohio Council of Churches, and he is a DOC guy. He is a Disciples of Christ pastor, and he is going to be here in the pulpit. Um, it is the Ohio Council of Churches in partnership with some other organizations that commissioned these paintings. And so I would really urge you to come on the 12th, bring your friends. He is just an extraordinary, extraordinary man and a wonderful preacher. So that being said, a few other announcements. We do have a short elders meeting today following the service. We'll just meet right over here in the parlor. Um, I want to remind you, if you've not already done so, to maybe drop that attendance card. You can just set it up here on the podium on your way out. I'll remind you that Elizabeth Lindy's graduation party is this afternoon, so I'm sure some of you look forward to celebrating with her and wanted to just make sure that that was before you. I want to remind you that um, this Wednesday evening, yes, do you want to add? A word? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if you need a car wash, and who doesn't need a car wash on a beautiful day like today, um, you can stop over and uh, for donations help out the FCCLA group at Holly's school. Thank you for sharing that with us. I want to remind you that we're, okay, so Wednesday, I'm going to watch the screens. There is a postcard writing campaign. It's happening up at Brooksville United Methodist Church this Wednesday evening. Um, it deals with House Bill 616. If you have questions or if you want to talk about that, I would welcome you anytime um, to reach out to me, and I'd be happy to discuss it with you a little bit more. If you would like to go with me on Wednesday evening, there, it is registration. Uh, they're asking for registration ahead of time. If you would like to ride with me, I've got a few spaces in my car, so let me know, and we can share a ride and participate in that effort on Wednesday evening. I want to remind you that we are going to recognize all of our graduates next Sunday on Pentecost Sunday, so we will have an opportunity to celebrate them in worship and then enjoy some much-needed cake following the service, so budget a few extra minutes in your schedule next Sunday for that. And then I also want to just hold before you that the car show is coming up really quickly. It begins on Monday, June 6th. That's a week from tomorrow, and Connie is going to share a little more. Uh, <laughs> So perhaps if folks are willing to help that first week, um, you might speak to Connie this morning and let her know so she has an idea who to expect. Any other announcements for the good of the order? I feel like we had a lot to talk about today, which is a good thing. We also need your used dishcloths. If you have some old kitchen towels or washcloths that are kind of ready for the donation pile, donate them to us because our drawer is looking a little spare down in the kitchen. We could use some, um, some dish towels and cloths if you've got those this week. Thank you. All right, friends, let us stand as we are able, whether that's in body or in spirit, and we are going to close by singing together, Now Thank We All Our God.
invite you to go out from this place in the unity of God's spirit, and I challenge you to be peacemakers within your own three-foot sphere of influence. Go in peace this week to love and serve God and others. Amen.